to First Congregational United Church of Christ in La Crosse, Wisconsin. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Welcome to this virtual worship celebration for the second Sunday after the Epiphany, January 17, 2020. If you're joining through the link shared in this week's e-greeting, just a reminder that there is an additional link there to a PDF file you can view or print the entire order of service and the hymns that we will share this morning so that you can participate more fully with us in our virtual worship celebration. We continue to say thank you for your continued support of our ministry and mission through your gifts. Gifts can be mailed to the church office at 2503 Main Street, La Crosse, Wisconsin, 54601. Gifts can be made online at our website, www.firstcongolax.org. There you'll find a Give tab and you can follow the prompts to make a gift online in various ways. Again, thank you for your continued support during this time when we cannot gather in person, but during which our ministry and mission continue. Again, a reminder to a call to our special annual meeting, Sunday, February 7th, 2021. This will be a virtual annual meeting and a special meeting conducted on Zoom. Because it is a special meeting, you will also have the option to vote absentee and on two questions that come before us in the meeting, the adoption of the 2021 budget and the election of officers, members of ministries, and committees. You will be receiving later this month information that will allow you to participate in that meeting either by Zoom or through absentee voting. <clears throat> we do not have coffee hour after worship today. We are going to be having a virtual Zoom coffee hour on the second Sunday of the month for the time being and we invite you to plan ahead for that, which will happen on February 14. At this time, I invite you into a time of worship, into a time in which we seek God and God seeks us, that we might worship together in spirit and in truth.
God has given us, we have come to worship and to praise. With thanksgiving, we offer to God the creativity of our minds, the warmth of our hearts, and the joy of our spirits. With glad hearts, let us sing praise to God, Creator, Word, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
claim the new life that is offered and know that there is forgiveness and healing to be shared. Through Christ, we are a forgiven people. Thanks be to God. Substance. 
In your book were written all the days that were formed for me, before they existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! I try to count them. They are more than the sand. I come to the end. I am still with you. A reading from the Gospel of John in chapter 1. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples. And as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which is translated meaning teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethesda, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph, from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said to him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Listen for what the Spirit is saying to the churches.
It's a shaky proposition at best, and always has been, this Jesus movement. The church in all its varied expressions, a flawed institution birthed from a remarkable movement that changed the world, rests on stories like we hear today. Decisions to go one place instead of another. Chance encounters and invitations, word of mouth, come and see. What was it about Jesus that caused people to believe in him and follow him with no evidence? We don't know. But there was something that drew people in. It starts with John the baptizer speaking to two of his own disciples one day. Jesus walks by and John says, look, here is the Lamb of God. That's all he said. And the two disciples of John started tailing Jesus. When Jesus turns and notices that he's being followed, he asks them, what are you looking for? They replied, teacher, where are you staying? Jesus says, come and see. And they did. One of these two was Andrew, and it's only a matter of hours before he goes looking for his brother Simon to tell him, we have found the Messiah. With that, they are on their way back to Jesus, who seems to already know Simon so well, in fact, that he gives him another name, Peter. Now there were three. The next day, Jesus found Philip. And don't miss that. Found Philip. It's not that Philip found Jesus, as the question of the door-knocking evangelist asked, have you found Jesus? Jesus found Philip. And Philip found Nathaniel. And what comes next is the unlikeliest of meetings. Nathaniel doesn't even seem to be interested in meeting Jesus. He was just doing his friend Philip a favor. His words to Philip suggest only a grudging participation in this venture. You think you found the one that Moses and the prophets spoke of? Yeah, right. A self-appointed preacher from that backwater of Nazareth? There's no hint in Scripture of a Messiah coming from that place, a dead-end town where dreams die a slow death place without promise? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Undeterred, Philip says simply, come and see. <clears throat> so Nathaniel and Philip are on their way, and when Jesus sees them coming, he says of Nathaniel, here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Jesus the backwater preacher of Nazareth, can give as good as he can get. An Israelite is one descended from Jacob the trickster, whom God renamed Israel. Jacob, Israel, was as full of deceit as they come. So the Nazareth boy gives the Israelite a jab of his own. Good to meet you, Nathaniel, an honest Israelite. Maybe it was a backhanded compliment, or maybe it was delivered with a smile to indicate that Jesus took no offense at Nathaniel's attitude about Nazareth. We can't really know. But I interrupt the story here because this is a very important but. We need to tread carefully here because by the time John's Gospel is being written, the break between Judaism and the followers of Jesus is happening. John often refers to the Jews as something separate from Jesus and his disciples, and often in negative terms. We must always remember that Jesus was a Jew, and so were his disciples. They did not think of themselves as part of a religion separate from Judaism. By the time John is writing his gospel 60 or 70 years later, the separation is beginning to happen. And John's negative portrayals may reflect some of that tension. 
For centuries, John's negative portrayal of the Jews has fueled anti-Semitism. So we must be absolutely clear in our repudiation of that. We must always remember that any challenge or criticism of Jewish leaders by Jesus is always delivered as an insider, not an outsider. It was a Jew addressing other Jews. And in this case, we certainly should not see Nathaniel <clears throat> We should, certainly should not see Nathaniel as somehow a good Jew in contrast to John's negative references to the Jews. Now back to the story. But wait a minute. You can see Nathaniel's mind racing as he processes Jesus' remark. Jesus wasn't there when Nathaniel made his crack about Nazareth. How do you know me? I saw you sitting under the fig tree before Philip called you to come and see. Whoa. How could Jesus have seen him? Jesus wasn't there. Jesus wasn't there when he was sitting under the fig tree. Maybe Philip was right after all. Maybe this preacher from Nazareth was the real deal. Could it be? And suddenly the traditional and honored titles come pouring out of Nathanael, teacher, son of God, king of Israel. But Jesus clarifies his title and says, do you believe because I told you that I saw you sitting under the fig tree? Well, you're going to see a lot more than that. You will see heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man, the Son of Humanity. You, descendant of Jacob the trickster who dreamed of that ladder of angels. But not just you. Something English readers easily miss here is the you is not just Nathaniel because you is not singular but plural. Jesus is perhaps to be an agent of connection, a thin place between heaven and earth, and his message will be about not just individual salvation, but salvation for the world, a collective salvation. There is a lot going on in this seemingly simple passage from John's Gospel. And yet, I'm still struck by the tenuous, shaky start in Nathaniel's walk with Jesus. But isn't it always, to one degree or another? The Jesus movement is founded on such nebulous and doubting moments as this. Had Philip and Nathaniel known Jesus before? Had Philip heard about him from Andrew and Peter since they lived in the same town? The text doesn't say. It only says that Philip followed Jesus straight away and then told Nathaniel that we had found the one promised in Moses and the prophets. Was the we Philip spoke of other people who were following Jesus? We don't know. When Nathaniel expressed skepticism about anything good coming out of Jesus' hometown of Nazareth, Philip simply says, come and see. Come and see for yourself. Come and see. That is the essence of our calling to share Christ with others. It is not our job to prove, but to invite. Come and see what following Jesus has meant for me. Come and see what my church is doing as we follow Jesus together. Come and see this one whose message is infectious. Frederick Buechner writes, All the way down through the centuries since that child was born, there have been countless different kinds of people who in countless different kinds of ways have been filled with his spirit, who have been grasped by him, caught up into his life, who have found themselves in deep and private ways 
healed and transformed by their relationships with him, so much so that they simply have no choice but to go on proclaiming what the writers of the Gospels first proclaimed, that he was indeed the long-expected one, the Christ, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, all these curious and forbidding terms that Christians keep on using in their attempt to express in language one thing and one thing only, that in this child, in the man he grew up to be, there is the power of God to bring light into our darkness, to make us whole, to give us a new kind of life to anybody who turns toward him in faith, even to such as you and me. What was there about Jesus to have that kind of effect on people? The Gospels give us snapshots of these transformative moments. Notice the profound effect he has on the Canaanite woman who verbally jousts with him. Witness his interaction with the blind man at Bethsaida and the Roman centurion. Observe him engage with Zacchaeus who has climbed a tree to get a view of him. The woman at the well the thief who hangs on a cross next to him. I think, if anything, the key may be in what Matthew observes in his recollection of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. For he taught them as one having authority. A phrase that's repeated in other Gospels in which I've engaged in other sermons. In a nutshell, Jesus was authentic. His walk his life and his message were consistent and compelling. He was transparent to God. There was no deceit, no artifice. And therein lies the catch. Come and see. The challenge for us who work not to prove but to invite is to consider what will be seen and experienced by those whom we invite. That's the catch. Come and see, but see what? For a long time now, a certain very vocal but rather narrow segment of Christianity has held disproportionate sway in the minds of many, particularly those outside the church. The picture held by many outside the church of what the followers of Jesus are about is not a pretty one. Marcus Borg used to ask students in some of his courses that he taught at Oregon State University to write a short essay on their impression of Christianity. Borg says that those students who have grown up outside the church have a uniformly negative stereotype of Christianity. They consistently use five adjectives. Christians are literalistic, anti-intellectual, self-righteous, judgmental, and bigoted. Wow. That's who they say we are. Is there any clearer evidence that we need to speak up with evangelical courage and say who we are as followers of Jesus? Come and see a different way, a more welcoming way, a kinder way, and we must make sure that that way can be seen when we invite. But friends, we have our work cut out for us. On January 6th, as the church celebrated the epiphany, the manifestation of God in human flesh, in the human flesh of Jesus, we witnessed a violent, seditious mob attack in our nation's Capitol building and on the legislative branch of democracy. It was for many an epiphany. The images, the videos, the words we witnessed hit like a gut punch and they revealed and manifested the sins that simmer within our fragile institution of democracy. 
white Christian nationalism and supremacy, overtly flaunted by many in the mob, has been built into the system since our nation's founding. We must not fail to notice that extremist religious ideologies were a key part of this. Profoundly disturbing to me was the presence of Christian images, crosses and flags, and posters co-opting the name of Jesus in a violent insurrection. I saw a man in a Camp Auschwitz t-shirt. Others wore t-shirts wearing 6MWE, an abbreviation for the grotesque statement, six million wasn't enough. White nationalism, anti-Semitism, and Islamophobia stoked this toxic brew. Religion was a part of it. I know, that's not us. But consider how many saw this on their screens and consider what they might assume about us as Christians from those images. Which is why what we do, what we say, how we live is so important. If we say, come and see, what will they see? Will they see an institution focused on self-preservation and maintenance of the status quo? Or will they see folks willing to risk failure in trying to explore new seas of ministry and mission? Will they see folks concerned with believing the right things about Jesus or folks trying to live like Jesus? Will they see folks who are passionate about their welcome to those who are not PLUs, people like us? Will they find a congregation determined to care for a creation that groans in travail? Will they find people willing to recognize and relinquish privilege that we are accorded simply because we are white? Will they see a body of Christ willing to put its money and commitment where its mouth is? Will they see Christians willing to walk the Jesus walk not just talk the Jesus talk. Come and see, but what will they see? Tomorrow as a nation we celebrate the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. In his writing, The Strength of Love, he wrote, how often our lives are characterized by a high blood pressure of creeds and an anemia of deeds. We proclaim our devotion to democracy, but we sadly practice the very opposite of the democratic creed. We talk passionately about peace, and at the same time we assiduously prepare for war. We make our fervent pleas for the high road of justice, and then we tread unflinchingly on the low road of injustice. This strange dichotomy, this agonizing gulf between the ought and the is. It's a shaky proposition at best, and always has been. The church, democracy, and its survival is not inevitable. It depends on us. Amen.
We are all called as ministers of Christ by our baptism. One way in which we minister is to pray for one another and for all of God's world. Our prayers are sometimes praise and thanksgiving. Often we plead for ourselves and others, and at times we lament and confess our failure. Trusting that our loving God hears our deepest cries. Let us offer our prayer to God, saying, God, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. We lament, O oh God, the tragic violence in our nation's capital, and we pray that the horror of it would open our eyes to the brokenness that plagues us. The worst sins of our history as a nation still hold us in their grasp. We pray for courage to recognize our complicity in the racism that warps our common life and our Christian witness. God, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. We remember your promises of restoration and covenant, and we call upon them now. We pray for an end to outrageous rhetoric and false witness, and a restoration of peace through justice for all. Deliver us from mistrust, chaos, and violence. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Renew in us the spirit of Jesus, that we may walk in his way and love as he loved. May your will be done on earth as in heaven. May our words and our deeds be those of truth, goodness, integrity, and kindness. God, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. We pray for healing and restoration in our nation. Where there is hate, grant us love. Where there is despair, give us hope. Where there is division, grant us unity. Where there is chaos, give us peace. Where there is isolation, grant us community. Where there is sin, give us repentance. Where there is retaliation, grant us forgiveness. Where there is vengeance, grant us reconciliation. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those close to us and unknown to us, for the sick and all who cry out in need, especially for Melanie, Joanne, Andy, Cindy, Jenny, Adeline, Eileen, Heather, Leanna, Carol, and all whom we name in our hearts. God, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. We pray for those who have died, especially Sis Hope. May the God who is our future hold her and all of us in the embrace of faithful love and bring us to new heavens and a new earth. God, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Recall us again to our baptism, O God, and hear our prayers in Christ's name. Remembering the words of Jesus, we are bold to pray. Our, our Father, Father, Mother, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Good morning, this is Lee Seth Logic. I'm chair of the stewardship campaign for uh, going into 2021. Because of you, our church sustains hope. This past year has many adjectives to describe it. Daunting, hardship, isolated, loss, awesome, hope, support generosity, gratitude, and grace. During the past year, the members of the Stewardship Committee have tried to speak to the steadfastness of the church and of our faith. We have worked at enlarging the concept of stewardship to exist beyond the fall campaign. We have asked you to think about pledging as a promise and a commitment as we entered the formal, formal campaign, we set some goals. A 15% increase in the number of pledges, a 5% increase in the amount of each pledge. Congregations that are the strongest have a high percentage of their members who pledge. The amount doesn't need to be a lot, but the commitment, the promise, helps shape both the family and the congregation. It helps focus our priorities. What are the valuable things in our lives and how do we nurture them? During the campaign, we talked to a lot of members. We heard the good stories, the hard stories, the life-changing event stories. Thank you for sharing those. As we close out the campaign, we wanted to share the results with you. We asked for a 5% increase in the amount of the pledge. So far, the average pledge is up 9%. Thank you for your generosity. For the number of pledgers, we fell short. Last year, we had 175 families pledge. This year, only 163. The goal was 204. Currently, we have approximately $342,000 pledged. This is $35,000 short of our goal of $377,000. We would welcome additional pledges, but we understand that life is uncertain for many at the personal level. Our nation is in turmoil. It's a frightening time. Hope is our theme for 2021, I can't think of a time that hope has been more needed. With generosity, with gratitude, with grace, together we will get through this. Thank you for being a part of our church.
the light from light, lead you also in your pilgrimage to find the Lord. May God, the Savior, who turned water into wine at the wedding feast, transform your lives and make glad your hearts. May God, the Holy Spirit, who came upon the beloved one at his baptism in the Jordan, pour out plenteous gifts on you who have come to the waters of new birth. Amen.